Medical care during the War of 1812 was performed by a surgeon and surgeon's assistant. This was done on the battlefield or on a Navy ship, usually in unsanitary conditions. At this time, instrument sterilization and personal hygiene were not practiced. The most common cause of death was infection and disease. Smallpox is a contagious disease that was passed from soldier to soldier. The symptoms included fever, vomiting, rash, and pustules. Dysentery was found in contaminated food and water and showed symptoms of bloody diarrhea, abdominal pain, blood poisoning, and kidney failure. Malaria is a disease that is passed to humans from mosquitoes. Symptoms are fever, chills, joint pain, anemia, kidney failure, and coma. Scurvy was a very common disease that killed many men. The disease was caused from vitamin C deficiency and could be prevented with a balanced diet. The symptoms of scurvy were liver spots, spongy gums, and bleeding from mucous membranes. Typhus was a disease carried by fleas, mites, and lice. Symptoms included fever, chills, muscle pain, rash, delirium, bleeding into the skin, and kidney failure. Typhoid was also contracted through contaminated food and water. Typhoid showed symptoms of fever, chills, weakness, muscle pain, diarrhea, and intestinal hemorrhage. Yellow fever was another disease transmitted by mosquitoes. Symptoms were fever, muscle ache, vomiting, jaundice, and kidney failure. Next, we will look at the common medical procedures of the day. These procedures were all done without anesthesia and often without any pain reliever at all. Amputation was the most common procedure performed. An assistant surgeon would retract the skin around the limb to be removed, and a circular sweep was made through all layers of the flesh down to the bone. The bone would then be sawed until it was loosened. The ability to remove the limb at a fast pace was the foremost concern of the surgeon. Trephining was a procedure that was designed to relieve pressure from the brain in the case of a skull fracture or a brain hematoma. A hole would sometimes be made in the skull or the wound could be used to access the skull if large enough. The brain would then be pushed away from the wound and fragments of bone or debris would be removed from the brain matter. Sexually transmitted diseases were rampant during the War of 1812. Protected sex was impossible and sailors and soldiers often became infected while docked at port or on leave. The treatment for sexually transmitted disease was extremely painful and usually did not cure the disease. The STD would cause inflammation in the urethra, making it difficult or impossible to pass urine. Warm baths would first be attempted to release the retained urine. If unsuccessful, a metal catheter would have to be inserted into the urethra and the bladder drained. This was only a temporary solution if the inflammation could not be treated. Wound exploration and removal of splinters and bullet fragments from wounds were familiar procedures to the surgeon in 1812. Bullets, musket balls, and fragments of debris were meticulously removed using probes, forceps, and ball scoops. Bleeding and cupping were used to treat a variety of ailments at this time. A surgeon would routinely cut the patient with a lancet and drain anywhere from 600 to 900 milliliters of blood. A surgeon would have six lancets in a case. 
cupping apparatus, and two setin needles to assist in the procedures. Cupping apparatus would be used to scarify the skin. This could be done by raising a dry blister or by making the area to bleed and then raising a blister. Counter irritation could also be produced by passing a setin needle through a superficial area of flesh, leaving a silk ligature that would gradually work its way out. This process is still used today in the treatment of perianal fistulas, usually caused by Crohn's disease. Surgeons at this time were also responsible for dentistry. Lack of hygiene among soldiers and sailors led to disease and poor dental condition. Surgeons would use tooth forceps to pull teeth that were rotten. Gum lancets and punches were used to drain gum boils as well as to induce bleeding in the mouth. Surgeons were also required to carry miscellaneous instruments. These included, among other things, two pint pewter clyster syringes and an apparatus for restoring suspended animation. Clyster syringes were used to give enemas, which were frequently prescribed. The syringes could also be used to flush out the urethra when infected with a venereal disease. Apparatus for restoring suspended animation was used to pump stimulating infusions into the lungs or rectum of the drowned or near drowned. The thought was that pumping tobacco smoke in the rectum or lungs would stimulate breathing. This practice was found to be useless and even dangerous. The term, don't blow smoke up my butt, came from this practice. Major medical advances would come decades after the War of 1812. William Morton would develop ether anesthesia for surgery in 1846. In 1857, Florence Nightingale would create the professional nurse and reform the British hospital. Robert Koch would propose his germ theory in 1890. Although these advances paved the way for the amazing medicine and technology we have today, many of the medical practices of 1812 have remained in use. Medicine will continue to improve and expand into areas that are so far unexplored. But in another 201 years, our descendants will look at our medicine as primitive. No matter how primitive it may seem, medical knowledge must be built upon, starting with the simple and ending with the unlimited possibilities of the future.